Hello, my name is Kate Redshaw and I'm a senior lawyer in the employment team at Burgess Salmon and I'm joined today by one of our partners, Luke Barry. And Luke, we're going to be talking about a particularly relevant topic today, which is the return to the workplace for people who are uh, reluctant about doing so. And of course, we've had the Prime Minister's recent announcement that he would like from the beginning of August people to be getting back into work. So those who have been instructed to work from home to be getting back to the workplace, although he has given employers some latitude around how they manage that. We've also got the winding down of the furlough scheme starting with, in August with employers needing to contribute towards that, uh, towards the costs of that. But, you know, a lot of people have been staying away from work since, what, the sort of the 23rd of March or thereabouts. And my sense is there are going to be people who are very anxious about having to come back to work and to mix with people. And perhaps one of those groups, I guess one of the groups that will be most concerned are those who have been designated clinically vulnerable and, of course, those who have been designated clinically extremely vulnerable. So perhaps we could have a closer look at, at, at those groups, Luke. Yeah, of course. I think you're right. The Prime Minister's announcement last week really has brought this sharply back into focus, hasn't it? Um, I think there's going to be any number of reasons why employees may be unable or unwilling to return to work. But yes, that clinically vulnerable category is a key area of focus for employers moving forward. So at the moment, the guidance distinguishes between the clinically extremely vulnerable and the clinically vulnerable. Um, the former are those with serious medical conditions. They've had a formal notification to SHIELD. They've been doing so since March, so for a long period of time now. Um, and if they've not been able to work from home, they've been designated as sick on SSP and or many employers have taken the decision to furlough them. Um, from 1st of August, those shielding um, requirements are going to be loosened, um, which I think broadly means that they're going to be treated the same as the clinically vulnerable category uh, of, of individual. So those who have been shielding are going to be able, I guess, to, to, to come to work if they haven't if they haven't been able to work from home? Yes, I think that's right. So if you take the clinically vulnerable category now for a moment, they're the over 70s or those with other underlying health conditions, diabetes, certain respiratory conditions, and those who are pregnant. Yes, the guidance says that they should work from home if at all possible, but if that isn't possible, the guidance doesn't preclude them coming into work, provided that extra social distancing measures are put in place and provided they're provided with the safest on-site roles. Because um, that's, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of employers have actually taken a different approach with regard to those clinically vulnerable people, haven't they? Yes, I think that's right. Despite the guidance, um, I've, we've seen many employers take the decision, maybe because those extra requirements are quite onerous, to keep those individuals at home, either reassigning duties so they can work from home, um, periods of unpaid leave, periods of sick leave, even though SSP is not recoverable in those circumstances, or again, considering placing them on furlough. So with the announcement and that change in focus, I think that's going to bring these sorts of issues really into play. Yeah, so on the assumption that more employers will will need to bring people back to work, what, uh, in two minutes if you can, Luke, <laughs> what are the employers' health and safety obligations? <laughs> Nice, easy question. Uh, um, well, you've got your statutory health and safety obligations, of course. Um, you've then got your common law duty of care towards the safety of your employees. Importantly, you've got that overarching duty of trust and confidence as well. And broadly, that means you're going to have to make your workplace environment safe for your employees. Those obligations have always been there. At the moment, of course, you've got the COVID-19 overlay. So you've got to adhere to the various COVID secure guidelines the government's issued um, for various uh, workplace environments. OK, so those are the ones where you've got, as an employer, you may have to adhere to different sets of guidelines because they've done it by type of working environment, haven't they? So you might have to have your office guidelines for those with it, with an HQ. They might have a factory, in which case it's a different set of guidelines. And I don't know, they might run a pub on the side, Luke, and have a third <laughs> set of guidelines to adhere to. Yes, so we've seen many employers having to grapple with various sets of guidelines. You're right, um, you know, they're specific to different workplace environments. Um, it remains to be seen how they're going to be updated from 1st of August onwards to take into account this change of emphasis. But I think the overriding theme is that the employer is going to have to vouch for and be comfortable about the safety uh, of their site um, before 
uh, requiring those employees to return to work. And as employers will have found with those obligations, it, it's no mean feat and it's quite a lot of work um, to ensure that you can say they are COVID secure. Okay, but I mean, everything I've been hearing, you know, particularly from the HSE, is that actually employers have been doing a pretty good job of adhering to those guidelines. Um, and of course, a lot of them have been worked up in consultation with the trade unions and with, with the employees themselves. So if, if as an employer adhering to those guidelines, is that enough to say to people, right, you need to come back? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that's not quite the whole picture, Kate. Um, Yes, you're right. The employers have taken extensive steps on the health and safety side, but there are additional things to factor in. So all employees, for example, have the right not to be subjected to a detriment or dismissed um, if they leave work or um, refuse to return to work, if they reasonably believe they are in serious and imminent danger. Um, that's been a real issue, a real live issue, um, A, because there's very little case law on those statutory provisions. B, because we're in completely uncharted territory, of course, so there's nothing to benchmark it against. And C, those provisions require an analysis of the reasonable belief of the individual subjectively. It needn't necessarily matter what the employer or indeed other employees view as the level of danger. So that's one thing to think about. The other briefly is obviously don't forget that many clinically vulnerable em uh, employees are going to be disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act. And if that is the case, of course, you're going to have a duty to make reasonable adjustments, and one of which could, of course, be facilitating or aiding um, a continuing um, work from home arrangement. And of course, also within the clinically vulnerable are pregnant employees, and they um, have additional uh, protection as well, don't they? Yeah, um, that's right. I, I don't say this lightly, Luke, but that, that's quite a lot of law. If we look at a bit more <laughs> of the practical um, side of things, you know, it's all about, I think, isn't it? you know, improving employee confidence, making sure employees feel confident about coming back to work. What practical steps have you been hearing that employers have been taking? Yeah, you're right. Uh, the good news is there are a number of steps employers can take to mitigate the legal risks. Um, so we've seen a wide range of practices. So at the start, we've seen obviously consultation and communication about the risk assessments. We've seen larger snap, uh, surveys and then SNAP surveys trying to address concerns and pinch points. We've seen a huge variety of communication channels where employers are telling employees what they're doing to make their workplaces secure. So newsletters, briefings, emails, direct line manager, contact, etc. We've also seen quite a few employers film their COVID secure premises, sort of taking employees on a bit of a virtual tour to try and really show and highlight how much they've done to try and make the workplace safe. But I think also just to try and take out the element of surprise when employees return, because it's obviously going to be a very different place than the one they are in in February or March. Um, so those are steps, obviously, which drive your desire to get employees back, keep them safe. But just very quickly on that detriment dismiss dismissal point, obviously, the more you can do to demonstrate the steps you've taken, that's going to play into whether there's a reasonable belief that someone's okay. in serious and imminent danger. Yeah, no, OK, I see that. Um, I mean, that's that's really interesting. And I think, as we've said, a lot of employers are doing really good things there. But one of the big issues which I think is going to be really troublesome is the commute. So people will say, do you know what? I'm happy to come back to work. I've, I've seen it looks very different, but I've seen what you've done and that all looks pretty good. But actually, how am I going to get into work? I don't want to go on busy trains, tubes, buses and so on. So, you know, what can an employer do about that? Yeah, well, the good news is, as a, as a broad um, overview, the employer is not responsible for an employee's commute to work. There are some arguments about how far the common law duty of care extends, but as a broad view, um, you're only responsible with health and safety employees in the workplace. You're absolutely right. I see this as a real issue, maybe more of an issue for some employers than getting their own sites safe. There are numerous surveys saying employees are very reluctant to use public transport for their commutes in and out of work. So notwithstanding the health and safety angle, you've got your duty of trust and confidence. You want your employees back. So you're going to have to think flexibly as to how you deal with this issue. Um, and we've seen a number of examples already. So we've seen people um, staggering their start and finish times to avoid peak commutes. We've seen real encouragement of alternative methods of travel. Um, we've also seen increased parking provision, for example, on the basis that most workplaces aren't going to be at full capacity for a, for a prolonged period of time. Yeah, I think the cycle to work scheme has been really popular. It's something that I've heard people 
Yes, yeah, certainly has. I think there's been a real uptick uh, in that. I think the other point just to flag is that the general view is absolutely the right way to take, but you've also got to drill down to each individual. So you know, a clinically vulnerable employee with a long tube journey every single day at peak time is a completely different issue and needs a different solution to perhaps the younger, fitter employee who's cycling or walking into work. So you can have a general strategy. That's an, that, but, that was an important bit from Boris Johnson's announcement, wasn't it? Which is that public transport is now open to everybody. I think previously we had been asked to, to, to leave public transport free for those who needed it to get back to work. But actually that is changing so that, that you know, transport is going to be busier. Well, yeah, and then that brings in the issues, doesn't it, in terms of, you know, it's going to make it even more a point that certain individuals are going to feel very uncomfortable doing it. Um, so I, I do think employers are going to have to think laterally. Yeah, so, OK, so if I have, I have, right, I followed my COVID secure guidance, I've got all of that one way system in place. I have, um, I've taken some videos, I've surveyed people, uh, it's all looking good, I've tweaked the hours so somebody doesn't need to travel at peak times on, on their bus, but they're still refusing to come into work. You know, in normal circumstances, Luke, I think we would be saying, okay, it's time to go down a disciplinary route, but Luke, I don't need to tell you this, these are not normal circumstances, so, so what's your view, what's your view there? Yes, um, certainly not normal circumstances. My view is that in certain cases, disciplinary action will still be justified. Um, it's not ever going to be the case you can't take those steps. But I think before you get there, there are a number of additional considerations you really are going to have to take into account. We've mentioned, for example, certain employees are going to be disabled um, for the purpose of the Equality Act. So reasonable adjustment duty there, you're going to have to think about. There's going to be a number of other potential solutions we've discussed this morning. Even if those flexible requirements or aren't possible in your circumstance, they're still going to think you're going to have to look at how you might be able to keep employees at home for a longer period of time. So can you adjust duties to enable them to work from home? Can you continue furlough? Albeit, of course, there's going to be extra cost of that until the end of October. Can you agree the individual taking some extra holiday? Can you agree a prolonged period of unpaid leave? I think if you're not seen to be taking all those factors into account, um, I think you could be criticised uh, given the unheralded circumstances we're in. I think if you, if you cut to the chase, it's going to come back to what we've been talking about. It's about employee communication, really sitting down with each individual and understanding and doing what you can within reason to address their individual uh, concerns before you then take any more draconian steps. OK, yeah, yeah, no, I can see that. Well, Luke, I could talk to you about this all day, but I suspect you have other things that you need to be doing. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope you found it useful. There are a lot of resources for employers on our COVID-19 hub, which you can find at the Burgess Salmon um, website. And there are a couple of uh, on-demand webinars there as well, if you're interested. And uh, it almost goes without saying, of course, if we can help you with any of your issues, whether they're COVID-19 related or uh, wider employment issues, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you for watching.